practice and life uh, cycle assessment. Uh, today, he'll be discussing the improvements uh, of pavement sustainability through uh, integrated design, construction management, construction management, LCA, and LCCA. Uh, as usual, uh, the presentation will be 40 minutes, followed by 20 minutes questions and answers. So if you have any questions during the presentation, please note it down and we can uh, do it at the end. You can ask it. So we have two options. It's either you ask it or you can write it in the chat, in the chat part and I can ask it on your behalf. Uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Harvey. Thank you. Can you hear me all right? And is the screen showing correctly? Yeah, everything is perfect. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's a great pleasure. Uh, it's COVID time, so I didn't get to travel to Champaign-Urbana, unfortunately, but uh, I always like going. But uh, thank you again for the opportunity. Um, I put this presentation together um, just this weekend, um, and uh, something we've been working on for quite a while, and um, kind of starts with a big picture, and then I'm going to work down to a couple examples. So the idea is improving pavement sustainability through integrating design, construction, management, LCA, life cycle assessment, and life cycle cost analysis. So a little outline, I'll give you a couple, uh, those of you who've never heard of us, uh, University of California Pavement Research Center. I wanna take, I'm getting to the age now where I'm you know, gonna impart some uh, wisdom from my many years, uh, but my father was also a, a historian, so I always, like to know where we're coming from and why we've done what we've done, which is history, and how that influences and informs us about where we need to go. So I'm going to talk briefly about changing system boundaries for pavement problems and solutions um, and what it tells us uh, about how to be successful and how to avoid problems in getting our research into practice. Uh, I'm going to talk about a vision document that I wrote um, about 20, well, exactly 20 years ago. Um, and we've pretty much been following that in California uh, with bumps and starts. Give you some examples about this integration. And then I briefly want to mention uh, what I call the forgotten pavements, and then I'll summarize. So quick look at uh, who and what is the University of California Pavement Research Center. Um, our mission uh, is research development and implementation, and I'm going to be talking about that. That is the research arc. Those aren't arbitrary words. That is the arc from idea to implementation, which means it's a part of somebody's everyday job, a practitioner's job. Uh, of economically and environmentally sustainable, equitably, equitably distributed, multifunctional pavement systems. We'll talk about each of those a little bit. Uh, we operate at two campuses, Davis and Berkeley. We have materials laboratories in both. Uh, we have accelerated pavement testing, um, kind of a mirror image of what ICT uh, has got going, um, except fewer faculty. Um, eight professional researchers, eight research and development engineers, uh, some grad, uh, graduate students, uh, tech and admin staff, and then lots of partner research organizations and high on our list is our partnerships with uh, University of Illinois over the years. Um, we operate somewhat differently than many programs in that we sign three to five year uh, interagency agreements with the California Department of Transportation. And this has been going on for 25 years now. And it's kind of one big program uh, rather than a series of individual projects. There's individual projects within those, but it's seen as a whole. And that kind of plays into a little bit what I'm going to talk about. And we really try and emphasize the full arc from conceptual to basic research to development to support and evaluation of implementation, and then trying to build in continuous improvement into each of those uh, to keep it going, make it sustainable uh, from a human organization point of view. And we'll be talking about that. It's kind of one of the main subject of today's um, discussion. And this is all titled, uh, very much on purpose, the partnered pavement research center, because we really look to go out and find the world's best expertise and bring it to California. We have basically a, a technology scanning um, and adaptation. We don't use the word stealing, um, borrowing uh, program as a part of this. Uh, 
I'm stuck. There we go. Okay, so some changing system boundaries going back 80 years, okay? So looking back in the 1940s, the main focus was on pavement materials. And then people began looking at pavement structures. Um, some of that came out of California, the California bearing, bearing ratio, which we haven't used since 1942 for state highways, but it still has the name California on it. Uh, then it, it was expanded to pavement uh, um, structures. And then once the network had been built out, we had a network of pavements that had been built and we sort of sorted that out. And then lo and behold, they started needing maintenance and rehabilitation and we had limited resources and we had to prioritize those. So then we began thinking about sustaining a pavement network. This is kind of where if you look at other countries and their pavement development, um, pavement network is where China has been focusing and Mexico, countries that really built out their pavement networks um, starting around 19, 1995, 2000. Um, this is where India is beginning to transition as India upgrades its pavement network. Then we began thinking more about how this integrates with the rest of transportation. Uh, then we had to think about environmental sustainability and much more about cost sustainability over the long haul. Uh, and now we're dealing with climate change and we're having to think about how do we make this resilient in the face of climate change. And then the public, as they learn that pavements can do more uh, and, 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 and affect their other things besides carrying vehicles, we are needing to think about multifunctional pavement. So this is a very busy table and um, I believe I can make this, uh, I'm allowed to send this over and you guys can post the presentation. Is that okay? I, I don't wanna go through all of this, but I'll, I'll just, this is my summary of um, kind of starting when we began to think about these increasing system boundaries across this, what the research was, and that we had to then go from research to development to try and get into implementation. And then a few examples over here, very cherry picked, uh, mostly focused on what I know. Uh, some examples of some of these things. And some of these things, as we increase the system boundary through our infrastructure focus on the left-hand side, some of these things we've been pretty successful and as a pavement enterprise, and some of these things we've gotten stuck in some places for various reasons. And thinking about why we got stuck, and in some cases, um, I've seen stuff, we're working on some stuff right now that, you know, in October, we're going to finish a research product and it's going to go out to training and implementation on November 15th. So that's just straight, straight off the presses, straight into implementation. And then I'm, I've been around long enough that there's some things that I've seen attempted to get implemented two or three times over the last 40 years and we still haven't really gotten it going. So why, why were some things successful and some things weren't? So uh, in 2000, 1999, I was starting to think about these bigger picture things and I wrote something called, we call the vision document. And you can Google this vision document. The link is down in the lower left-hand corner. If you just Google UCPRC vision document, you can see it. This was published in December, 2000. Um, and, and that was written, I'd already been in the business for 15 years, 20 years, or 15 years, and five years working with the DOT. And I had a, an awareness that were large, important changes that we needed in what I call the pavement enterprise. Uh, and we had a history of repeated failures in getting to widespread implementation in some of these. Um, and in addition to things we already knew in the pavement enterprise that we needed to change, we started to see things coming from outside systems, uh, outside of the pavement enterprise, which we're gonna require the pavement enterprise to make additional changes. So I put this together because um, Jorge Prozzi, who was is a UT professor now, he was a doctoral student. He says, John, you talk about a lot of stuff, but I just, doesn't, it's not very clear what the heck you're talking about. So why don't you write it down? And the, the, the purpose of this was to try and lay out a strategy, comprehensive strategy, and plan to try and not re repeat mistakes of the past, replicate successes of the past, and find a path forward to get research into practice, and then make that 
a system for a sustainable system for continuous improvement. So some observations regarding the problem to be solved. Uh, decision making, much of the decision making in the state agency and definitely in the local agencies was not data driven by data. It was driven by what I call engineering, engineering by anecdote. It was peaceful, people's somewhat random personal observations, but there was no data that really backed up a lot of the decision making that was going on. And everybody had an opinion, so people were going all kinds of different directions. I, I thought that we needed a, a comprehensive data that everybody could look at, and then we can discuss data rather than our anecdotes. So data were not being collected, they were not organized and made available to other data owners, and data ownership is dispersed in our implementing agencies, and they don't, and they're siloed. Uh, also, we need tools to use the data. Raw data is not useful, it's not actionable. Um, and the use of data was not integrated. We were producing some tools, uh, and I still see this um, in different things being put together uh, by the Federal Highway Administration, for example. One group's working on this tool, one group's working on another set of data and another tool, and they're actually predicting the same thing, but in different parts of the project delivery process, and they're, they're not communicating with each other, and they're not using common data and models, and they're producing different answers, which is very confusing. So we're not integrated through the project delivery process of planning, design, and life cycle cost analysis, construction, and traffic management, asset management, and environmental life cycle assessment. You can't get the seed to grow unless the soil, the ground has been prepared. And that means that our potential users need to be trained in the fundamentals to be able to use and understand our tools appropriately. And, and this is a self critique researchers were often not completely comfortable with the hard, dirty work of not just doing the research, but moving that through and integrating with stakeholders and dealing with all the critiques and the problems to get this to an implementable tool and then following through with the technology transfer. So some observations regarding how to successfully move forward. Um, we need to have appropriate training at all levels. And, and at the policymaker level, that means about 15 minutes that they can get a handle on it. Um, managers, industry, as well as the frontline staff we normally deal with. Support for implementation, it takes on average, and there's a huge spectrum, it takes on average about eight to 10 years to move from concept to implementation. And you've got to have support for that all the way through. Um, and during that time period, you have high turnover and changing responsibilities in the implementing agencies and we must be able to communicate as new people come in communicate in a few minutes the whole arc and where we are on it so we can't just complain about this this is not something we're going to change but we have to figure out how to deal with this so those are the ways forward so the proposed solution uh, was a strategy and tactics for the development of integrated databases and tools uh, to be developed so they're compatible with each other and so that they can be upgraded and, and produce continuous improvement without losing their ability to interact. Um, this requires integration of software specifications, workflow processes, information flow, equipment, and methods. A little bit of advice I got along the way discussing this with folks is to be successful with um, implementation. Um, to be successful with implementation, um, if you have $10 to go from concept to implementation, you need to spend about a dollar on research, $3 on development, and $6 on implementation. And that, that is often reversed in terms of how we um, prioritize and, and give resources. The other advice came from the then director of Caltrans Research at that time, and he said, you know, this, is, is more of an IT problem than a pavement problem. And state government is, lit, and particularly in California, you see my little headline from August over there on the right-hand side uh, continues. State government is littered with IT failures because 
people with technical domain knowledge were in charge. The idea is you can't just let the pavement people try and solve the IT problem. You've got to go and solve it as an IT problem. You've got to understand how to do that and deal particularly with the data ownership issues uh, within the organization. Okay, so here's the org chart. Uh, we have to be able to precisely answer these questions. And these are questions that make a lot of researchers, including myself, uncomfortable because the people who are gonna support implementation need answers to these questions. And we can't hem and haw and, and waffle. The questions are, is this a solution for something that's important to the implementing agency or do we have a solution? Do we have a hammer and everything looks like a nail? Is this a solution looking for a problem to solve? Are we really solving their problem, not our problem? How much money will it save? And we need to turn that answer around into a life cycle answer. How much will this improve the environment? Greenhouse gas in particular in California, but uh, all the other environmental problems. What is your confidence level that this will work? Um, the answer is never, I'm absolutely certain it's 100%. It's not usually not an honest answer, but you have to give your best, best understanding of that, understanding all the issues of implementation. Where are we in the process? And what are the risks? And what's your risk management plan? Now, out of all of this, uh, develop the idea of the pyramid. And oftentimes, the management would ask me the question, okay, you're going to solve this problem, which software package should I use? And we used to say software package is the top of the pyramid. And when Pharaoh asked his engineer to build a pyramid, the engineer said, well, I need to start at the foundation. And the foundation in, in this solution for everything is the data. We need the data foundation to do anything else that we want to do. And we must recognize that. And that's where the bulk of the effort, the issues, and the money lie is in, is in building that database. Uh, and this applies across our paid management system, our design systems, our costing systems, and our environmental systems. And we need to be able to update that information. Data changes, things change. We need to be able to have a, a process for updating that. Databases first, software after data. And in between are the models. Got to have all those before you can get to the final solution. This is the same thing applied. This comes from Federal Highways document on the right-hand side. This is a little bit better. Developed this about eight years later. Um, the key first is a framework. And then we have to do the data definitions. And then we collect the data. Once we know what data we need, then we have to get that data validated and organized. Then we do the models and the tools and then we can turn that into actions. Um, where this is at in LCA is, is, is they're developing the data, the framework's done, the data definitions for background data are being done. Um, some folks like the University of Illinois and the Chicago Tollway LCA, you've already gone through this entire process uh, on a local level. Thinking in terms, and this is where you need to start thinking of integrating, getting all your tools and all your data. If you need or using the same data for different tools, you want to define that data the same. Otherwise, the data uh, from, that you develop can't be used for all the tools. And, you, and if it's the same thing, you want to be using the same data. So you need to have same data definition. So this is what uh, one of my colleagues calls a confusogram. Um, but this, <laughs> this is a mapping out of our tools on the left-hand side and the data definitions that are common to each of these tools. So for example, if we look at the pavement asset management system on the top, it needs treatment names and definitions that match the treatment names and definitions that we're using in our design tool. Otherwise, it's hard to get our design tool to communicate with our asset management tool. It's difficult to get into a system of continuous updating and recalibration. Um, our asset management tool should use the same treatment materials, names, and definitions as our lifecycle cost tool and our treatment names and definitions as our lifecycle cost tool and the same as our lifecycle assessment tool. If our costing tool is calling things this 
and our life cycle assessment tool is calling things something else, but it's the same thing, it's, it starts to make things, the whole system starts to break down and lots of inefficiency comes in and confusion. Okay, same thing applies to models. I won't go through all of these, but this is the mapping of the different models that we use. And many models we want to be able to use um, across different tools. We want a roughness model, an IRI model that we're using in the asset management system should be, we wanna use the exact same model when we're predicting pavement vehicle interaction and greenhouse gas and air pollution, et cetera, from, from vehicles using uh, the pavement in the life cycle assessment tool, we wanna use the same IRI model. Uh, if we're using different models, you're getting different answers, confusing. So this is the integration of the models. This is how we communicate it with upper management. They say, what the heck are you talking about? And this outlines the databases on the left. This is not as comprehensive, but databases on the left, models in the middle and software on the right. And, one, and these are the different tools here. One of the things to note, each of the data elements on the left-hand side, uh, there's about five different owners of the data within the agency. And getting those folks together uh, took us about 10 to 15 years to get them working together to use common definitions, et cetera. How do we communicate with management where we're trying to get, where we're coming from, and where we are. So this is what we call our uh, research arc roadmaps and we have them for about 16 different areas that we're working in. Um, the idea is to develop and use a design, this is mechanistic empirical design for concrete. The vision is always in the upper right to develop and use a design procedure that provides the most accurate prediction of concrete pavement performance possible within reasonable time and cost. That needs to be in one paragraph, short paragraph, that management can understand where we want to get to. On the left-hand side is uh, the, the, the shoulders that we're, we're standing on to build this up, the work of others. Uh, and then where we are, the ones that are solid lines are the work that's been done. The ones that are dotted lines are the work that we see to move us to the vision. Uh, and this tells them where we are. And each year this tells us, okay, we finished that, that moves us this far. Do we have any implementable products out of that? But then these are the next things that need to be done to move us to the vision. Here is one for uh, performance related specifications for um, asphalt concrete. And here is one for active transportation as examples. Okay, so now an example, um, mechanistic empirical uh, pavement design is the process shown here. It takes climate, materials, and structure, traffic, uh, runs mechanical uh, simulations of the pavement and how it damages under climate and traffic. Um, those are based on strains and stresses. Uh, that gives us damage. That's the mechanistic part. And then we need to have, we need mechanistic models that work. And then we need to make sure those match reality. And at this point, we're not purely mechanistic. We need empirical transfer functions to predict distresses based on damage. And these are simulated simultaneously for each distress. Um, we are using a program developed here called, well, I like to pronounce it call me, uh, as in relax, be calm. Uh, some people pronounce it call me. Uh, and this is an incremental recursive simulation program. Um, it actually simulates the entire damage process, including aging and damage and other things going on uh, so that we get, we actually predicting a time history of damage in the pavement, uh, which we then correlate um, with distress. Our response calculations, our damage calculations have been calibrated using primarily accelerated pavement testing with heavy vehicle simulators, and then further uh, checked under different traffic speeds using the West Track accelerated pavement testing data and some data from uh, National Center for Asphalt uh, Technology and MinRoad. So that's the response part. Um, the thing, the next step is to do the empirical transfer functions that relate the damage to the distresses. So the goal of this ME calibration is simulations that match Caltrans pavement performance for, we're not gonna build the same pavements in the future, but we need to make sure those models and those transfer functions are able to predict what happened in the past. 
which means we need to adjust and use materials from the past to calibrate and then use materials from the future to, uh, as they've changed to uh, predict the future. We wanna simulate the truth of pavement performance as best possible and we need to use database reliability. Reliability is the probability that the pavement won't fail before the intended service life. Um, we've gone with a, a different, reli a new reliability approach in CalMe uh, based on the observed variability in the Caltrans network. Um, and we're accounting for that measured variability with our reliability calculations. So to do this, we, we spent a lot of time thinking about sources of variability and how do we handle those with reliability in a low bid uh, project delivery process? And what we've done is we've divided this up into within project variability. And within project variability is the variability of construction for a given contractor with a given one material. Uh, and what's the variability of the materials production and construction processes within one project? And this incorporates whatever subgrade variability we haven't accounted for, et cetera, but it's for one material, one contractor. So what we've done is we calibrate this with the distribution of cracking as a cumulative distribution function within a given project. And then when we go to design, we're using um, data that we have for distributions of critical inputs that, that change that within project when a pavement fails, it doesn't fail like yesterday the entire project was good and tomorrow the 100% of the wheel path is cracked. And so this is really tracking the progression within a project. And we use Monte Carlo simulation uh, for that within CalMe. The other variability is from project to project, between projects and material to material. And what we found is that the majority of the variability between projects is based on the variability of the performance related properties of the asphalt material um, from producer to producer, project to project. Now, a designer does not know the properties of the material that the low bid contractor is gonna, gonna give to us because low bid is design bid build, which means that you don't know who won the job when you design the project. So what we've done here is that we have um, set up distributions of materials performance related um, uh, properties and we've set a reliability level on the between project materials based on testing we've done uh, over the last five years to set that up. Um, so the conventional approach to mechanistic design calibration, you go out and you get a set of test sections and you test the materials properties and you use those materials properties for those test sections to do your calibration. You simulate knowing the properties of the, of the section. Typically, you can't afford to do that on more than about 50 to 200 miles of pavement small test sections distributed because there's a lot of field testing and lab testing and you're testing these materials five to 20 years after the thing was built. Um, the approach we, we said that's not very efficient and we wanna use big data analytics to do our calibration. We wanna use the entire network of Caltrans asphalt surface pavements since they started collecting data in 1978. Now we can't go get the materials properties for all that. So we can calibrate for the things that a low bid project designer knows but we use statewide median values, 50% reliability for the factors that a low bid designer doesn't know. And we came up with median values from our historical properties over that period since 1978. What they don't know is the, the materials performance related properties. And by the way, we, so this approach, we've also just used to calibrate our pavement ME concrete uh, design method as well. Um, so instead of having 50 to 200 miles of observations, we have hundreds of thousands of miles, lane miles, I'm sorry, tens of thousands of lane miles of observations, and we have hundreds of thousands of observations. Um, and now we had to characterize distributions of materials. Luckily, we've been doing performance-related testing um, since uh 1995 and so we had a pretty good idea what these properties were even for these historical periods and had median properties for these different periods this just gives an idea so we have hundreds of miles of data for different thicknesses 
for different structure types, for different binder types, um, for different climate regions and so on. Uh, and there's a lot of variability of pavement performance out there. That's the first thing you learn. The more data you get, you really get a sense of the amount of variability out there. And we're capturing that real variability from the entire network in the calibration. Um, to be able to come up with the distributions of materials properties um, for, the, for the Monte Carlo simulation, uh, we have numbers of sections. Um, and these are the different mixes that we're using. And out of this, we come up with median values and coefficients of variation for thickness, um, stiffness, and permanent deformation properties and fatigue properties and cement, cement stabilized layer properties. Um, the within project uh, variability, we looked at uh, variability of uh, within a project because we have multiple values within projects and that's what allowed us to use uh, for that part of the reliability calculation. So application of this now, um, we're, we're really moving more. We've done some major, very big hundreds of millions of dollars pilot projects with performance related specifications for asphalt pavements. Our design goals, our, our, our long life standard design life is 40 years. Um, with just periodic replacement of the, of the surface layer. And this integration uh, is happening as a part of this process of mechanistic design combined with performance related properties. So we're integrating materials properties, design and our construction quality assurance. So what we do is uh, for a given big project, we sample, we have, we have an idea of what materials properties are from locally available materials. We then set performance related specifications that go into the bid documents that the contractor uh, is bidding against and they know that they need to meet those mechanistic properties with their mix. We also test for surrogate test properties uh, for construction quality assurance because those tests take longer than we can necessarily, uh, that, that we can do it for job mix formula approval but we can't do it during construction because of turnaround time. We then design the pavement using the properties that the contractor is contracted to deliver. So we've integrated the design with the PRS. And then the winning low bid contractor must prove that their job mix formula for the asphalt mix will meet or exceed the properties that we use to design the pavement. And then we use those surrogate tests during construction to tell us if the mix has changed substantially. So uh, this is a typical example of a, of a long life structure that we're using for these big 40 year designs. It's got a polymer modified surface. It's got a high wrap mix to give us a stiff middle layer and what we call a rich bottom layer on the bottom. Uh, we've done, we're in the middle of the fifth project right now. Um, we also have some uh, better compaction requirements to get longer life out of these same materials, um, which we can capture through our performance related specifications both on the materials delivery that the contractor gives us and count on those in the mechanistic design. Um, these are the tests that we're using. Uh, flexural beam for the job mix formula approval. Uh, we're using fracture energy potential for the construction, the surrogate test. Um, and we're using uh, repeated load triaxial for permanent deformation. Uh, we have to use statistical uh, methods for accepting those materials. Um, You've got to work with your industry to make this implementable. So the way we've set this, the statistical um, requirements up is that we take all of, we try and take all of the testing risk off the contractor and put it on the agency. So they're only really doing, dealing with the risk of variability of the actual mix. And then we, you can't, you can't meet performance related specifications and hold them to all the volumetric mix design requirements. So we, we waive most of the volumetric mix design requirements. This is an example of the specifications on the current job, Sacramento 5. And again, you, all of this presentation I'll send for posting. Um, but this is the spec they're bidding on. Now, most of our contractors have no idea, they've never had to design a mix for fatigue and stiffness and permanent deformation. They've had to design mixes for VMA and end design and things like that. Many of them really have no idea how to go about this. That's a risk. 
the risk costs money. <laughs> so we're trying to reduce that risk and we've produced a mixed design guidance for use with asphalt concrete PRS. There's the link. Uh, and it basically walks them through um, how to make mixed changes, mixed design changes to achieve fatigue and permanent deformation PRS um, starting from the cheapest things they can do and moving through to the most expensive. And this has been used quite a bit by our contractors on the current job. Okay, switching gears a little bit. Um, another integration, uh, just taking a look at California greenhouse gas emissions. Um, look on the big yellow area with the little car over here on the bottom right. Um, we've made some pretty massive gains in California in our electricity. A blackout here, a blackout there, but our electricity uh, production and a lot of our industrial production, and we have not made progress on our transportation. So 41% of our greenhouse gas emissions in California come from trucks and cars. It's about 39% from trucks and cars. We can make a small contribution with how we deal directly with the pavement. My estimate is we can change the overall state uh, greenhouse gas emissions by about 0.7 to 1%. Things we do with pavement, we need to do that. We need to make our contribution. But our biggest question is, how do we design the infrastructure to handle changes in the vehicle fleet? And I'll give you the quick results on a project that we just finished for the California State Legislature, allowing slightly higher axle loads because uh, electric vehicle and, f and fuel cell trucks, uh, their powertrains way more than an internal combustion diesel engine right now. If, Caltran if the legislature allows slightly heavier axle loads, is that gonna cause a lot of greenhouse gas emissions and costs from increased pavement maintenance and, re and, and rehabilitation? So we worked with our, our alternative fuel vehicle center and, and then modeled um, both changes in cost and greenhouse gas from the conversion of trucks to alternative fuels and, and reasonable levels of implementation, and then combine that with what we expect that to do with the pavement. And then two days ago, uh, the governor just signed a new executive order uh, that we're gonna be banning, as, as long as we don't get stopped by federal government, we're banning sales of gas powered cars by 2035, new cars, and working on truck conversion. Oh, and by the way, greenhouse gas, that's an existential issue. But in the meanwhile, we have the worst air pollution in the country, even when we're not burning down our forests. And we have some of the highest levels of asthmatic children. So we have some right now things in addition to greenhouse gases. So the results of this were that um, introducing the heavier alternative fuel trucks is expected to result in only minimal additional damage to local and state government-owned pavements. Why? because the implementation will be low for the next 10 years. And then we expect these powertrains to get a lot lighter and they will be a lot lighter by the time we actually get to full uh, build out of the fleet by 2050. So it's really the timing of implementation and improvements in battery technology that are gonna save us. So our, our answer back was, it looks like the pavements are not gonna be a big deal. And, um, under these different scenarios, we can potentially reduce by 20% our entire transportation sector emissions um, over this time period. So this is a kind of thing, integrating these different data and models, we're able to come back with some answers for some pretty abrupt changes in what's going on. So to wrap up, uh, how does state government, last thing, uh, implementation, how does state government currently pick their sustainable practices? Um, Lobbyists are weighing in, consultants are weighing in, a little bit of universities. Everybody has lots of things that they think we should be doing. Sometimes these are backed by good science, sometimes not so good. Um, how do you prioritize these things? There's a thousand things we could do. And I just wanna put on another integration is integration of life cycle cost analysis and life cycle assessment to prioritize by producing a supply curve of alternative technologies that we can implement to figure out and prioritize the x-axis here is each of these boxes, the gray and white box is one strategy. 
And then how do we prioritize those? Well, the width of the box on the x-axis is how far it moves us towards our goal. And the y-axis is how much is that gonna cost us per unit of change. And the idea is to prioritize these things um, so that we start with the cheapest or even the ones that save us money over the life cycle and do the cheapest ones first because that's going to move us the farthest for a given amount of money at the farthest towards our goal. And this is being done. We've done a study for Caltrans internal operations, and we've also done this for local government reviewing their climate action plans. This is the example from the Caltrans study. Um, and until you put it in this graphic of the supply curve, it's hard to capture these big numbers. Um, I'll just give two examples. Strategy four over there on the left-hand side, uh, major increase of, of wrap in our asphalt um, moves us a little bit of the way to the right. And actually the main thing that wrap does is it saves money as long as we get equal performance. The long thin blue line there, uh, 13, a lot of benefit is maintaining our pavements in the asset management system and keeping them smoother, our concrete and our asphalt uh, through better timing of our maintenance and rehabilitation. Now that costs us a little bit of money, but that's the biggest bang that we can get for the buck to move us to the right. And this puts us in a very easy form for decision makers to understand. Forgotten 80% of our pavements in California, 80% of our pavements are, the, the lane miles are owned by local government. They spend about 60%, well, they spend about a third of our money and they carry half of our traffic nearly, and yet we put very little attention to them. So everything we're talking about, implementation needs to consider how to move it to local government. Um, based on this, in the last couple of years, we've created a local government pavement improvement center for training, best practices, and then to take our Caltrans tools and put them into a form that local government can use. So takeaways, implementation. Research has no benefit unless it's implemented. The benefit to cost ratio of research is zero unless we can get it to implementation. Cold hard truth. This requires planning and a coordinated strategy. Implementation in, 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 in our mind really requires data and tools that can be readily used, updated and improved. In pavement, we think this is greatly facilitated by integration of our data and tools. And we believe this can achieve some pretty big cost savings, reductions in environmental impacts, and answer important questions as they are needed. Investment in the human capital at the state and local and consultant levels is absolutely essential. The seed won't grow unless the soil is prepared. And now is the time for a lot of change because the average age of a state of, of a pavement engineer at state and local government is about 55 and about 30% of our engineers are looking to retire in the next five or six years. So a lot of the resistance is gonna go away, and, um, but all of these people need training. And the last thing is, uh, I don't know how many have ever heard of S. David Freeman. I'd, I'd suggest that you look him up. This is one of my major role models, and I met him one time at a seminar, and he said, the transportation sector is about to enter a period of profound change like the energy sector in the 1970s and 80s. Regulations will be implemented requiring increasing energy efficiency and environmental performance. And you see some of that with the governor's actions. This is happening more and more. Transformation is necessary to maintain our economic competitiveness. We cannot stay in place to remain competitive economically. And we are no longer rich enough to make, you know, try it three times and get it right on the third time. We've got to get this right the first time. We're not as rich as we used to be. And that requires that our research gets translated into practice and we figure out how to communicate with the public to achieve our goals. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Harvey, for this very uh, informative uh, presentation. Uh, we do have a few questions. So uh, as I mentioned before, guys, we, we do have two options to ask questions. Either you write it in the chat or the other option is you, you raise your hand and you can ask it directly to Professor Harvey. Uh, currently, I do have uh, uh, CT asked the question uh, in the, the chat. 
So basically, his question is regarding the tool itself, uh, the Calm E. Uh, and he was asking about like the programming skills. How are you guys doing the, the tool? Are you doing it in-house or are you doing some cooperation with tool developers? Um, so it's programmed in-house. We have three people doing the programming. Um, one person in particular is doing the data integration and he handles um, the data that's also used for the pavement management system and some of our other things. Um, other person is doing the mechanistic models and they work together. And then we have a third programmer who's doing the web interface uh, for this. Um, so the first two are doing the, the, the data models data structures in the compute engine, and then the other guys doing the, um, the web interface. Um, this is um, now the official Caltrans asphalt pavement design method. Uh, the new calibrated version is getting rolled out with training and so on. We're adding models for in-place recycling right now. Um, the eventual vision for this is that and we're going to send this out for peer review, by the way. So some of the folks on this call may get a offer to uh, and a request to take a look from Caltrans at this and give your opinions, critique of it. Um, the eventual idea is that this, because we have control of the source code, um, that we set up a consortium. So those who are developing models, we would have a development version of this basically as a model tool and try and um, you know develop a little bit more of a worldwide consortium to. Um, speed the pace of improvement and also make it available as a teaching tool at very low cost. Uh, thank you. Uh, any other question? Uh, Egerman, you may ask your question. Be sure and unmute. Hello, can you hear me now? Yeah. Well, sorry about that. Um, thanks a lot for the presentation, Professor Harvey. Uh, just one question regarding the um, quality of the crack data. We saw that um, a very big problem is perhaps the subjectivity of the severity and perhaps like extent in some cases of uh, mm -hmm. field crack data. And well, there are some techniques now using like with cameras and machine learning, but those right. still suffer from the same problems. How do you perhaps came over that or like, did you have a plan uh, for this particular problem? Yeah, major problem. By the way, we've been cleaning, working on this data set for 15 years, <laughs> I will mention. Um, no, not 15, sorry, nine years. No, it was 15 years, sorry, 15 years. And in and, and 2010, the automated pavement condition survey was implemented. Uh, and we, we um, so we've been dealing with this a major problem. Um, we know that our manual condition surveyors going back to 1978 had a tendency to rate things. They'd pick out kind of the worst part of it because they were trying to drive funding. So we know, we've talked to them. We know the bias that they imparted there. So what we've done to, now we did one good thing that we did have is we had three or four years where the manual survey was continuing and we had the automated pavement condition survey going in parallel. So that gave us somewhat of an ability to figure out some um, bias uh, between the two approaches to the pavement condition survey. Um, so that's helped us to some degree, but you still have a lot of variability in there. Um, and that's a given and that just needs to be accounted for um, in the analytics when you're doing it. It's a problem, but it's not a showstopper. Let me put it this way. Um, one of our best transportation students in traffic, she doesn't work in traffic. She works for Walmart and she figures out, she uses all the techniques that we're using here and she figures out what you wanna buy before you even walk into the store. <laughs> she has ways. And one of our other students who's just graduating, the guy who just calibrated our concrete, um, the pavement ME for concrete is uh, he, I thought he was working for a structural firm. He's working for Zillow, which is the real estate web app. And he's using all the, all the, the things that we're doing here for pavement, for the calibration, all those issues with data. Uh, he's using that to figure out um, flip time for housing 
a Zillow buys houses and then flips them. Um, my point is Walmart's making a lot of money and so is Zillow. And there are these variability and issues in big data, but there are ways to deal with that. We need to think probabilistically and, and, and start to think in terms of big data, the issues with it, but it's still got massive truth within it, buried within it, and, and much more complete. So you're overcoming a lot of those issues just with sheer numbers and amount of data. Uh, we have uh, a question in the, in the chat. So Hissam is asking about, based on your experience, what are the area of opportunities that remain unresolved uh, for the near future research on pavement LCA? On pavement LCA? Yeah, so he's asking what is still needed in the sure. pavement LCA research? Um, well, some things that are going on right now, um, remember the bottom of the pyramid, data definition, data framework. So we I'm have the no way. Sorry? I think that was an issue. Oh, okay. So we have the framework. Um, a lot of the issues have been on um, background data. So there's a federal agency initiative called Federal Commons right now, uh, where they are doing common, the idea is common data definition. So everybody's using the same background data, fuels, um, basic, basic processes that are, are germane to all LCAs. And then the uh, initiative is then to collect um, a with a common data definition so that you can, you, you can move data from tool to tool um, and, and the data means the same thing. Um, and then filling those databases first on a national level and then on a regional level. So I think that's a huge effort is developing regional databases and then setting up processes for continuous improvement. Our industrial processes change over time. What's our, what's our method? What's our organizational strategy uh, as a pavement LCA enterprise for updating and improving those regional databases. So that's a huge area. Um, better models for a lot of the things that we're doing. Um, bringing in, you know, we, uh, moving from deterministic to probabilistic, the same as we're doing in, in mechanistic design. We treat most LCA as pretty deterministic right now, and it's absolutely not. Um, I think those are some of the, the the biggest areas that I can see. And then, and then, you know, when we're pretty confident with this stuff, uh, moving ahead with the tools. And Illinois was definitely a pioneer in that, moving ahead in a massive effort and getting a, a first generation tool out there. Um, we now need to, you know, keep getting those tools out there and improving them. Well, I'm sorry. And then we've got to keep training people and, and doing the human capital improvement uh, so that they understand LCA, they understand where to use it, that it adds value to their decision-making process. Huge effort on that side. Thank you so much, Professor Harvey. I'm not sure if there is any more questions. Yeah, I think these were the, the, sorry, the, uh, I the questions. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, Isaac, I cannot raise my hand, I guess, because uh, okay. <laughs> you considered me the host here, the, the Zoom webinar. Uh, thanks, John, again, for your excellent presentation. I think one thing attracted my attention that uh, we just finished a project here in Illinois. We were looking at uh, pay for, uh, for performance and relate that to the uh, quality uh, uh, assurance. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that I noticed here that you are trying to get away uh, with volumetrics and replace that with some uh, real measurements. And this is really good. Yeah. So Partially, we're, we're measure... going step by step, not exactly. completely intimate, yeah. And that's actually my question is how the contractors are taking this and if there is a pushback and how you are applying this because this is a major change actually oh, yeah. Huge. Uh, when it comes to, to the industry. Yeah, so the very first project, um, long life pavement meant only concrete in 1998 when the first project was being put together. And, and, and asphalt industry said, because asphalt industry didn't have a really good reputation for longevity <laughs> uh, for a number of reasons. And they said, oh, ooh, we can be long life too. We don't want to be completely cut out of this market. So Caltrans gave them 
one of the heaviest truck traffic pavements in the United States. It's the, it's the interstate that leads out of the ports of Long Beach and Los Angeles, which are the number two and three ports uh, by some measures in, in the country. Uh, that was a very rocky road. They had no idea how to achieve, they had no clue. What is fatigue? How do I change a mix to meet fatigue? Um, that has continued to some degree. We do a lot of the early projects. We had kind of a firewall that, you know, we were Caltrans representatives. We weren't supposed to tell them what to do. Of course, even help them what to do. They were supposed to sort it out. The lesson learned was we need to partner much more with them and have Caltrans blessing to, we understand how to achieve fatigue and reading properties. Caltrans freed us to work informally with the contractors, keep them informed, but work informally with the contractors. And so, and then the other thing we did is create that mixed design guidance to give them the basic framework for if I do this, it gets me here. If I do that, it gets me there. So it's still been kind of rocky. Each new contractor has to go through the 12 stages of, of grief, you know, anger, denial, what are they, the rest of them. Um, but what's happened is the recent projects have all been in the same region. And once a contractor gets this figured out and they've been through this once, they are in there winning that bid because they have better knowledge. They're going to apply their smarts. They went out and found other people to do the fatigue testing. And they really now they, they've learned the new rules of the game and contractors want to win within the rules of the game. We change the rules of the game on them. Once they get up the learning curve, they can play the new game. And so now what we have to do is we have to try and get into some other regions in the state so that we can get a critical mass of contractors who, um, who know the rules of the game. And then the other ones will learn as a part of that. Um, joint ventures, uh, we have a joint venture on this contract and that's helped some. So yeah, it's a process, it's an issue. That's one of the major obstacles and step by step and, um, and, and, and trying to work with them much more directly to get them up the learning curve and out of the fear zone. All right, thank you. Uh, thank Isaac, you so much, I, Professor Harji. Sure, am I sending the, the PowerPoint to you? Yes, please, if you can send it to me. And in addition to that, this, uh, this lecture was recorded, so it will be available on ICT YouTube page. Okay. So anybody who wants to watch it, it will be online in like an hour. Great. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Professor, for your time and all of the, the knowledge that you shared with us. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.